Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. I'm Celine Urquides. I'm the Education and Clinic Coordinator at the Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities. Um, before we get started with our presentation, I have a few housekeeping things to go over. Today's session is being recorded and all recordings and materials are gonna be available in a couple of weeks. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please type your question into the chat. Uh, or you can use the raise hand button if you'd like to speak. If you encounter any technical issues, um, please send a chat to the Sonoran Center for Excellence and Disabilities. We'll be monitoring the chat. Live captioning is available. We're grateful to have Marissa as our captioner today. To access the live captions, please click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. We also ask that audience members remain muted unless you're going to speak. Um, lastly, I'd like to read the university's land acknowledgement as we start today's session. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being the home of the Adam and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Thanks. All right, so today I wanna to introduce our speakers. We're excited to have our friends from the Autism Society of Southern Arizona. They're here to present to us on uh, autism-friendly communities. We have Kate Elliott, Maxine Matthews, and Jade Muncie. Thank you guys so much for having us here. I'm gonna share my screen real quick so everybody can see our slides. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Like she said, I'm Kate Elliott. I'm the executive director of the Autism Society. And I came to the autism world because I have a now eight and 12 year old um, who are both autistic and I do this job so I can advocate for them and make the world a better place. And we're so excited to have you guys here today. I'll let my team introduce themselves. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Maxine Matthews. I'm the information and referral specialist for the Autism Society of Southern Arizona. Um, I came to the Autism Society because I have two boys on the spectrum. Um, one is 19 and one is 14. Um, I was born and raised here um, in the Sonoran Desert, and I am um, the granddaughter of my grandmother, who was full-blooded Yaki. Um, so this has uh, been my home for much longer than I've been alive, so I'm happy to be here. Hello, I'm Jade Munzee. I'm the Program and Marketing Specialist. Um, I came to the autism world when my firstborn came into my wonderful life um, and made it so much better. Um, he was diagnosed with autism and when he was three. And since then, he's now seven. Since then, I've been trying to learn everything I can about autism. Um, I'm also a self-advocate, which means that I was diagnosed on the spectrum and I try to use my knowledge and information to advocate for people with autism. I also have two other boys who I love and adore. They're just not necessarily on the spectrum. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, um, so the Autism Society of Southern Arizona is an affiliate of the Southern of the Autism Society of America. Um, there's many autism societies across the country in different states. We usually serve Pima County and South, um, but we are I, I will help anyone in the state if they call me and they're looking for services. All of our programs are free um, and we try to serve every uh, demographic in the autistic community. So we have um, programs for children under 10. We have programs for children over 10. We have programs for adults 18 and over. Um, as you can see, the list of programs that we have with parents of group support groups, we have uh, trainings in our lunch and learns. Um, and then my program is a navigating autism program, which means that anyone who is seeking services and resources can call me and I can uh, find those services for them. Or if there is no services, we can discuss like creating those services in the community. Please go to our website. It's www.as-az.org if you would like to learn more about our free programming. Mm -hmm. 
So let's talk about um, the CDC. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released updated data where the number of children diagnosed went from one in 40 in 2021 to one in 36 in 2023. As you can see, 1% of girls and 4% of boys. Um, and these new rates were released in March in 2024. This is the first time girls have been included um, because they made an entire percentage finally. As you can see that 1%. Um, so previously girls did not get diagnosed as much as boys because most diagnostics were based on boys, um, on how boys displayed and girls sometimes displayed differently. And there's other factors for that too. Um, I also want you to uh, see that this is the, the fact that non-Caucasians were at a higher rate really is a good thing, not a bad thing. It just means um, that we feel like the, the populations that are underserved um, are actually getting more resources and are getting out there and being able to get evaluated and diagnosed. So, um, and then I just wanna say that one in 36 is probably not an accurate number um, because this is based on uh, eight-year-olds in the Maricopa County of being diagnosed. Um, so we're talking about, think of all, everyone who's not eight years old that can be diagnosed. And what we uh, always like to talk about is how many adults are getting diagnosed now. Um, so that one in 36, uh, we do believe is a higher number. So at Autism Society of Southern Arizona, we've been really striving to use this um, type of training to really gain allies for the autistic community. And what that might look like um, is there's these different types of allyships. One is individual. So this is you learning how you're learning about autism, what it, what people maybe have it in your life, maybe what mindset you might have originally, um, and trying to to educate yourself and model that good behavior and that mindset. And then we have our interpersonal relationships. These are surface issues um, that you're going to change from day to day with how we interact with people. Maybe um, maybe it's family, maybe it's friends, maybe it's even coworkers who you just are going to be more aware of uh, autism and if someone, for example, like if someone said something rude about someone else, maybe you would be able to talk to them about it or about how maybe that was a rude comment about autism or something. And then we have our structural changes, which is pushing no the norms, pushing the policies and the systems, um, and really working together to make those structural changes. Um, so this is a type of allyship that we are hoping to Call all of you who are here to, um, and just because you came to one training doesn't make you an ally, but it's a start and it's something that we're excited about because we need everyone's support to help make other people's lives just a little bit better. Sometimes it's it's um, really hard. And so even if it's just a little bit better to have that support, that's what we're here for. That's what we want to do. Next slide. So before we begin, if you guys want to, if you can, you can put in the chat um, what kind of things you, I love it, someone already posted something, um, what kind of things, misconceptions you might have about autism. A lot of the frequent, one, frequent ones, oh, I can't talk today, are that maybe they're all geniuses, they're all savants, um, they're not very affectionate, maybe they don't have any empathy, they can't talk. Um, they can't learn new skills. Maybe you've heard or thought, you know, that kid just looks like a brat. He's just misbehaving. Um, or maybe you've seen that they're they're violent. Um, and that's kind of your interpretation. Okay, I don't know if you saw any that you wanted to read. Um, if anyone has any that they want to share. Um, this is a, like it says, this is a safe space. So even throughout the conversation, it's a safe space to ask those questions. Yeah. Um, it's better to ask them here than to someone else, maybe. <laughs> Somebody said, I have autism being considered a special gift. I am against finding a cure for autism. Totally yeah. agree. We agree too. And somebody else shared an, uh, uh, an article from Australia that they're finding the ratio of women is actually to men is actually closer to three to four. I love Australia. They are really, really at the huge advocates. I can't wait to read that article. Thank you for sharing. It's great. Yeah. 
And also remember, we are all, um, we were all in the same boat at one time. We didn't know what autism was. When my son got diagnosed, I had actually um, had only heard of autism once before. So I had very little knowledge as well. So that's why, I mean, we're, we're in the space. It's going to be safe for whatever you think. And then um, we, we've been there. So. Yeah. yeah. So, and some of us might have some recollection of like seeing Rain Man and kind of thinking of that. And it's not that that's, that that doesn't look like autism. That looks like that person's autism. Um, and obviously that's an actor, but they're all, they can be different for everybody. They're going to fall under certain umbrellas, but not everyone is a genius, but some are. Um, not everyone is super affectionate, but some are, right? It's going to be different for everyone, um, but they're going to follow some certain characteristics. So if we go to the next slide, we are going to watch a video. Mm -hmm. And yep, I really like this video. It just helps us give get an idea of some of the basics. Go ahead, Kate. We are all different, and that's wonderful. Some differences are easy to see. Height, hairstyle, gender, eye color, and so on. Other differences can't be seen. Our favorite foods, fear, or special skill. Interestingly, the way we see the world is all... Oh, oh sorry, guys. We are all different. <coughs> And that's wonderful. Some differences are easy to see. Height, hairstyle, gender, eye color, and so on. Other differences can't be seen. Our favorite foods, fear, or special skill. Interestingly, the way we see the world is also different. For instance, what do you see in this drawing? Most people see a duck. But some of you might have seen a rabbit. Whichever you saw, you are correct. This is just a trick drawing to show you that all brains work differently. The brain is your body's computer. It works differently for all of us and controls how you learn. That's why we are all good at different things. How you feel, which is why we all feel different emotions and how you communicate. Sometimes the brain is connected in such a way it affects the senses and how we perceive and read situations and interactions. This is known as autism. Many people have autism, so it's likely you already know someone who is autistic. And for this reason, it's useful to know a little bit about autism. The special wiring inside an autistic brain can sometimes make the person good at tasks we may find difficult, such as mathematics, drawing, or music. It can also do the opposite, and activities we find too easy are incredibly difficult to them, such as making friends. The senses constantly send information to your brain about your surroundings and other people. However, when a person's brain and its senses don't communicate well, the brain can become overwhelmed and confused, affecting how they see the world. Picture yourself walking down the street. This is how an autistic brain may experience the same world. Scary, isn't it? Sadly, in many cases, the person can't say out loud how they feel. So even though there's chaos going on in their heads, they seem okay on the outside, unable to ask for help. We will develop behaviors to help us feel calm in uncomfortable situations. We may look away, hug ourselves, chew our fingernails, fidget, bite our lips, and so on. Equally, autistic people develop behaviors that help them cope with these intense moments. These actions may seem unusual, but they're just their way to feel calm. When they happen, it means they are having a hard time. The kind thing to do is not to give them an even harder time by getting cross, ignoring them, or mocking them. 
People with autism need friends who are willing to take the time to know them. With good communication and plenty of patience, everyone would be better off. People with autism are not ill or broken. They simply have a unique view of the world. And with a little support from their friends, they might just be able to share that view with us. Autism can make amazing things happen. I love that video so much. I don't know if it's his voice or what, but I also love autism, so it's probably all that. Um, okay, so here are some of the actual criteria. Like I said, it can be different for um, everyone, but for the most part, these are going to be the main criteria for getting diagnosed. So um, this is from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. And the first criteria is social communication deficit. So this could look like being nonverbal, um, or it could look like having a difficult time expressing yourself in an appropriate way, um, or it could look like needing to write um, to communicate or use some sort of other communication. Um, I like to think of it more as just like communicating differently versus communicating deficit, um, just differently than what maybe we would um, typically do with this with the interactions that we have from other people. Um, the second one is going to be a fixed interest and repetitive behaviors. So um, again, this could look like someone really interested in trains, um, but it can also look like someone really interested in autism. And um, it can really vary, um, but they're going to have that fixated interest and repetitive behavior of um, that being the one thing. Um, the second, the third one is the symptoms existing in early childhood. So this is an important one. It means that they, that autism was present from a young age and didn't just occur when they were 18 or 30 or 50. Um, this is something that has existed their whole, relatively their whole life, um, or at least developed a really young within their childhood. Uh, number four, so criteria D, is symptoms impairing function. So this means that at some point, wherever they are on this spectrum, um, it's going to reach a point, their symptoms are going to reach a point where it impairs some type of functioning, whether that is in communication, whether that is their fixated interest is causing other issues um, where they cannot function in some other form. Um, so somehow it's going to impair functioning. I would say impair typical daily functioning. Um, criteria E is the impairments are not better explained by intellectual disabilities. So this is a very important one. Not everyone with autism is going to be intellectually disabled. There are some people who will have comorbidities and also be intellectually disabled, but the majority of people, I would say the majority, I don't know, that could be, I could be saying too much, but most of the people for the autism diagnosis aren't necessarily intellectually disabled. And so that's not going to fit that diagnosis. Does that make sense, Kate? Uh, enough. Um, I see there's a lot of stuff happening in the chat box, but. Yes. Um, okay, so those are the main criterion for being diagnosed on the autism spectrum, at least according to DSM-5. Um, CDC has that, again, it's a social communication difference or deficit and the fixated interest, repetitive behavior. So those are the things that are really focused on um, for people with autism. So, yeah. And it's important to know that, um, oh yeah, never mind. Okay. That important. Must I not did, be that important. I did want to say one thing. Um, uh, I, I do want to say that back in 2013, the American Psychiatric Association discontinued the separate diagnosis of autism and Asperger's to one of autism spectrum disorder. So when people say like, I was diagnosed with Asperger's and I can't get my services, um, it usually looks like because they need to be reassessed, reevaluated to get that autism spectrum disorder um, diagnosis. Um, so that's, that's one I wanted to put in there. Yeah, that's great, Max. Um, 
I was originally diagnosed with Asperger's, but obviously um, it's all part of that spectrum. So yeah, that's an important key. Um, and if you need help with that, or you know someone that needs help with that, you can always contact Max and try to, she can try to figure out which people would provide you with the proper um, diagnosis. Um, okay, so more universal symptoms of autism. So here's a, here's again, hyper or hyperactivity to sensory input. Um, so this means that the person might be a um, sensory seeker or sensory avoider or can differ for different things. So maybe someone really likes loud noises and, but they don't like a uh, fast movement or maybe they like, I mean, I think of it, it can be different, right? For everything. They might like their song really loud, but they might not like your song really loud. So, but somehow they might have hyperactivity to the sensory input. Um, and then we can go to the social and communication deficit again. This can be verbal or nonverbal. Um, and then the difficulties in relationship development, maintain uh, maintenance and understanding. This one, I wanted to point out that it is a two-way street. Um, we a lot of times want to provide therapies and things to help with these communication issues, with these um, relationship issues. And sometimes it's a two-way street. Sometimes we have biases that are blocking us from developing and maintaining a better relationship with people on the autism spectrum. Um, it takes only seconds for someone to judge whether or not they like another person. And sometimes that can be really uh, debilitating for people on the autism spectrum, or especially when it is face-to-face -face because they might present differently. Um, like they might be flapping more and that might throw someone off um, but it's important to understand that gaining relationships with people on the spectrum is going to be a two-way street and it's important to adjust your biases and your um, mentalities on people with autism in order to develop relationships with people on the spectrum um yeah i think that's good you can tell the i, I covered a lot of the topics um, already all right, so next we're going to look at the autism spectrum. A lot of people think of it as being a line from like less autistic to very autistic, but that's not actually how it looks. Because autism is a dynamic disability and has so many different issues and challenges and strengths that can affect the individual. So we have like social differences, interests, repetitive behaviors, sensory sensitivities, emotional regulation, and all those things. So one person could have really like their soup their special interests they are super focused on but they don't really have much sensory sensitivity or they're a really great um, communicator but they're really bad at executive functioning or somewhere in the middle so everyone they say one you've met one autistic person you've met one autistic person that's really what they mean because every autistic individual has their own rainbow of their own personal autism spectrum that they are coming to your day with and that can even look different sometimes if you're tired maybe your executive functioning isn't so great. So that's going to change for you. And it's kind of more growing and changing. And that person is in each individual is coming with their own personal rainbow. And just believing and asking them is a really good thing. Another thing on this is high terms like high functioning and low functioning are harmful and outdated because they really kind of imply that somebody who's high functioning doesn't need any supports or services if they have they have you know they have a job and they're all together and they don't actually need any accommodations which isn't true they could have a lot of they could have accommodations they need they could have struggles in a lot of different areas but still be able to carry on a job and all those things that would people would look at as high functioning when vice versa if you need when the person is low functioning if the the people often will talk about people who don't have speech as being low functioning functioning but that again is not indicative of any other part of themselves. We always say to presume competence, that the person, even if they can't speak or whatever, you presume that they know what you're talking, what you're saying to them, how you're interacting with them, unless told otherwise. So it, because it's so dynamic, it really just is a beautiful thing to understand and just coming to every person with the other understanding is really helpful. So another thing people often think of is that autism is for kids. So like once they turn 18, they're gonna grow out of it, it'll get better, they'll grow out of their autism, it'll get fixed or cured or something of that nature. 
And that's not the case at all. Autism is literally how your brains function. The brains look differently under MRIs and then these aren't going to go away as you get older. So as an autistic individual gets older, they're still going to have those sensory considerations. They're still going to have communication needs. They're still going to have self-stimulatory behaviors. And what we want to talk about is that masking is when an autistic individual pretends to look more um, not autistic, to look more normal or neurotypical so that they can fit in. And But it doesn't work very well. We look at our little donuts. I love this visual representation of it because this poor donut's being made fun of. And he's molded himself in to be like, just like these long johns. And they're still like, you're a weirdo. And we don't want to them, any autistic individual to feel like they're weird or any of their behaviors or their, the way that they hold themselves, the way they communicate, there's nothing wrong with that. We want them to be their authentic selves. And it's really important that we start that with small children. So they learn and they know from the onset that they are good, what they do, how they move and how they live in the world is perfectly acceptable and wonderful and all those things because masking we have discovering now is all these adults and be introduced and uh, diagnosed and found from the last generation that it is really really damaging to your mental health to mask and so we want all of these children to grow into adults uh, wonderful autistic adults and really be able to be part of our society so we want to make sure we encourage everyone to just be themselves so I just told somebody in the chat, I would talk about this in a second. So one of the challenges that um, autistic individuals may face is communication. And that can look like a wide variety of things. And for some people, that means that they don't have access to verbal speech. They cannot speak. For some people, it means they cannot speak in every situation. Like the person in the chat had mentioned that they, their grandson or somebody talks around their parents, but they don't talk around their grandparents or people at school. And that is completely normal. It's why, I don't know, probably some level of anxiety or comfort or thing of that nature, but they are just aren't able to use speech in those situations. Some people go to um, like they call called selective mutism, where they they lose all access to speech, where they would would be able to give you a whole dissertation before, and then they lose access to speech because of the situation that they're in. But for some people, they just never have access to speech, or it's an emerging um, thing that they're working on. So you, these are different tools that you may see people use out in the world to communicate better. Starting with like the basic sign, baby sign. I haven't really run into any autistic individuals who use sign totally, but I'm sure it's totally possible. Um, just to be able to get those basic needs across, like eat, bathroom, so that it really eases that frustration when you give them these tools so they can communicate some things. Because could you imagine being in a world where you couldn't say, I'm hungry, or I have to go to the bathroom, and all these adults around you are just wondering why you're screaming? Giving them ways to be able to communicate in different options and different opportunities really gives them that voice and gives them that ease and the ability to advocate for themselves. Another thing is over on this left hand, the boxes, I don't know if you see my cursor, it, this is called a PEX system, a picture exchange communication system. And it really is little like tiles. They have different things on them. A lot of basic communication needs. I've seen some moms with some big old binders of a lot of different options. And you can go that route for sure. And it just is just so that they, they can point to their basic needs and communicate. When you put these pictures on a device, then that device is called an alternative augmented communication device or commonly referred to as an AAC device. And they so they have all the pictures and kids can, or anybody can create sentences. Some of them can type out words and it'll speak for them. There are professionals living professional lives, doing working regular jobs, speaking and doing everything with speaking through AAC devices, using either pictures or typing, things of that nature. So it's just another form of communication. And I always say, I don't care if they're skywriting, I just wanna hear what everybody has to say. So all forms of communication are valid and beautiful. And also we have, Another one called spelling, which is when people, this often comes to people who have 
um, physical disabilities like apraxia or things like that. But even without that, some people who just don't have access to verbal speech have found spelling as a means to be able to communicate. And they um, so they point to the letters and spell out something and then they have a communication assistant who records what they're saying and they can either say it for them or they could type it in chat so depending what you're doing. And there's actually a wonderful movie we screened last September that called Spellers about the people who are utilizing this. And it's a beautiful story about so many people were silent for many years and they they had no idea that they were having they were brilliant minds in their being, but they just weren't able to express themselves. And spelling has made a huge change in a lot of lives, giving them access to communication, to be able to speak what they're saying and let people know what's going on with them. <clears throat> so again, this is more about communication. Um, so you may, we also didn't say a lot of times people with autism, and again, this isn't everyone, but avoid eye contact. And so with that, sometimes it might seem like they're not listening or they're not understanding, and that's definitely not necessarily true. Um, so they may seem indifferent. Um, Kate talked a little bit about the situational mutism. Um, echolalia is when they repeat or echo something a lot. Um, they may have an odd speech pattern, it might sound robotic, or it could sound maybe different um, tones, it might have tone problems with putting the wrong, the right emphasis on the wrong syllable, um, stuff like that. So there are ways, sorry, um, but there are ways that we can help with that, with the communication issues, giving more time to process what you're saying, using very clear and concise language. A lot of yes, no's can be helpful for some people. Don't rely on subtext or social cues. Um, and using their special interest to try to communicate and connect in some sort of way is also a really great way to, again, to facilitate that gap in um, in the bond is using what you can do and how you can help to bring those communication difficulties and differences together um giving very simple one-step directions maybe it's one at a time um also you can ask a clarifying question like did you understand that did it make sense to you um avoid metaphors and sarcasm if possible and again everyone is different and so you're going to have to figure out just like with any relationship and any person that you're in in a relationship with, whether that's friendship, family, anything like that, you're going to have to figure out who you're talking to, what things you can say to them, what things you can't say to them. And it's going to be the exact same thing for someone with autism. So next slide, Kate. And so these are some more of our social challenges. So <clears throat> you may see someone who has an in who does inappropriate laughing or giggling. So maybe you you think that they shouldn't be laughing at something. Um, I have a permanent awkward smile for a lot of things. So if we're talking about death, this is my face. This is what my face is going to look like, and that might seem really inappropriate, but it is my way of dealing with what we were talking about. Um, and so that might occur. Um, they may seem totally indifferent. Maybe you're talking about something awful and you're trying to get them to express something and they have a blank slate on their face. It doesn't mean they're not listening or that they they don't care. It just might be the way that their face is. Um, I talk a lot about, like, I don't know what my face is doing. Please don't rely on that. Use Listen to my words um, and let me express myself that way. Because, um, yeah. And another interesting thing is I have my son with autism who's seven and my son who doesn't have autism who's three. And I could not pick up on the baby cues, the baby facial expressions or anything. And I, I really thought it was just me. It might be me and him, right? Because then when I had my second, I realized, oh, he makes so many facial expressions and it's a lot more obvious to tell what he is thinking. And But my oldest with ASD just had a very limited expression growing up that it was so hard for me to tell. Again, that didn't mean that he didn't have feelings or interests or anything like that. It was just really hard to tell with his 
limited of facial expressions. So they may also not understand appropriate volume. So this can be really loud talking really loud or maybe talking really, 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 really quiet. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, there's lots of different options here. Um, mental health challenges with anxiety, depression, PTSD are going to be higher with people with ASD. Um, and there's lots of statistics on that. They kind of range all over the place because it's really hard to get people to tell you, you know, how depressed are you? And, and all the time. Um, and they may not make eye contact. They might seem blunt or direct. And again, that doesn't mean that they don't care about you or anything. It's just going to be their way of communicating. Um, I used to laugh inappropriately at times. I still do an echolalia from four. Yep, yep, definitely good examples it's in the chat box. Sorry, I'm reading them. I love them. I love it. Yeah, text messages can help for sure. Using, figuring out ways to communicate with people that just because it's not the neurotypical way doesn't mean it is any less important or beautiful or wonderful. So I love that. Don't lose hope, she said. Um, yep, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to move on to talking about sensory considerations and overload. This video is um, just an aims to give you the experience of what it could be like for one autistic person to experience a situation. It's just an idea for things um, it can be a little jarring at first, so you can turn down your volume or whatever, but I want you to be mindful of the fact that autistic individuals don't have a volume button to turn down. So if you're uncomfortable, lean into that. Um, sensory challenges are a, something that can be a challenge for autistic individuals, either like Jade had talked about, either being hyposensitive or hypersensitive. So they could either have, they're very sensitive, they all, something that would be small to somebody else is big to them or vice versa. It doesn't really affect them as much. And that happens a lot with like touch and things. So we know the sensory system, right? So we know sight, touch, smell, hearing, and taste. We know how all those could be bright lights, uh, lights that make noises, the smells, other people's perfumes, the, just loud places in general, foods that are not good to you, touching when you don't want it. With my daughter, if you touch her head, you could touch her most other places, but if you touch her head, it's over for you. Um, so all those types of things are, just different options and different the things to consider. Things that, oops, sorry, <laughs> we did what we 
uh, senses we don't often talk about are introception. So introception is the feeling of what's going on in your body, the things that we don't generally think about, but they're innate feelings like hunger, needing to go to the bathroom, um, your heart rate racing, being tired, feeling sick, having something wrong in the pain inside your body and not knowing those can, people with autism can have introception issues where they don't feel those things as well. So, but they don't know that they're hungry. They're not aware that they have to go to the bathroom. They're not aware that they're sick, but just because they're not consciously aware of it or able to communicate that to you doesn't mean it isn't affecting them. My daughter is just, when she about turned eight, but just recently had gotten to the point where she can really understand that she is hungry and that hunger is fixed by eating. Now, was she hungry before? Yeah, absolutely, all the time. But instead, she was just hangry and didn't want to eat anything but candy because she wasn't hungry. And what's the point? And so she would, eating was a very hard thing for us to get her to do. But she still had all those feelings and all the repercussions of not eating, of being actively hungry. They were there. They were just bugging her and breaking down her ability to handle the world at large without her being able to directly interact with them. Proprioception is your place in space, like how you move about the world, how you feel about uh, how you, how far away this is or that is. There's a really fun way to test your proprioception. So everybody can do this. Ready? If you close your eyes and put one arm out in front of you, with palm facing down, and make sure your eyes are closed when you do this. You take your other finger and you point to the center of your palm that's down over here. How close did you get? Did you actually get on your hand? Did you get some other random place? That is just one small representation of how your understanding of your sense in space. So I've heard people call like the ADHD walk or whatever when you're avoiding corners and running into tables all the time. It comes into play when the realization of you're standing way too close to somebody or way too far away from somebody, all those types of things. There's just a lack of understanding for them in that way. And then is the stibular sense, which is your, is your movement sense. And it's how your body moves through the world and the feeling of it can affect your balance and things of that nature. The stibular input, like swinging and rocking and things of that nature, can be incredibly, or some, can be incredibly regulating to the sensory system. And so that's what leads us to stimming. Stimming is self-stimulatory behavior. It's that repetitive behavior that they're talking about in the diagnosis. And there are things that you can do to that are there. The very classic one is like a little boy flapping his hands. It can be pacing back and forth. Echolalia, Jade mentioned earlier, is another form of stimming. It's like repeating phrases or words over and over and over again, or even just making a sound like, ah. Uh, um, I have some friends who make loud shouting noises all the time. They're not mad. They're just making loud shouting noises because that's how they stim. Um, Jay, uh, Max is showing you her things. I always play with fidgets. My desk is covered in toys because I can't. My brain doesn't operate unless my hands are doing something. Stimming is incredibly helpful to everyone. That's, we really, really try to normalize it. It may look strange in public, especially if somebody's having bigger stims running up and down a grocery aisle or something of that nature. But there's, but it's super, super helpful to calm the nervous system to give your helps your brain work. People actually listen better when their hands are busy. So the whole old adage of quiet hands, open ears isn't really functional. You, that's why I really encourage all sorts of STEM toys and all sorts of things in classrooms and the world and everyday life to help people have that regulation. Everybody stims to some degree, if you're biting your nails, shaking your leg, all those types of things. How do you move to make yourself feel better? Yep, clicking pens, all those things. And they could turn into, you know, all sorts of greater things. But we really just want to send it home that stimming is fantastic and, normal and great. Sorry, James. I'm looking for something desk. Okay. All right. So um, now that you've known all this information about their sensory needs and things that people go through in the world when they have autism, um, 
what is going to happen when you're going to work with someone, meet with someone, if you have a family member, if you have a student, um, uh, because of this knowledge, uh, we always say, well, now we've given you this training. Now you can ask if anyone that you're going to come in contact that has autism, if they, if they need accommodations. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about what accommodations can look like. Um, if someone is overstimulated for some reason, I can use an example of um, my son. If the lights are too bright and there's people laughing and talking and everything, he can get very agitated. He doesn't like crowds. He doesn't like going to um, malls or anything. We went to Disneyland and it was, it was a four hour experience. Um, and uh, so what I always want to talk about is that I have a, I try to always get him a break space wherever we are. So if we're on vacation, I try to hope that he has his own room to be able to take a break. In his, in my house, obviously it's his bedroom. Um, uh, if you are not able to create a break space, um, and break spaces can look very specific um, depending on uh, everything that you've learned here. You could, they, you could fill them up with fidget toys. Um, you can have boxes of earphones in rooms or in a place that you know that there's gonna be uh, somebody who, who needs extra accommodations. Um, hats, hoodies, sunglasses. Um, so those can all be in a break space. Um, if you can, do not have a break space, can they sit in a different space? Um, if you're going to be talking about things that they need to know, uh, what kind of terms and visual aids can you give them? If you're working with someone that needs to accomplish certain activities, um, make a list before that. Uh, or if you're gonna wanna know something that like, oh, please don't do this or please do this. Um, if someone can visit the area, um, it's always good every time um, my kids have gone to a new school or to a new doctor. I always try to go to the office or to the school and tour first. Um, and uh, a lot of times what you can do to do that is take pictures of those areas, um, an office, a school. If they're going to go visit a family member for the first time, take pictures of them like, who is this person? This is your aunt. Who is this? This is your cousin. Um, and you can do that. And that's called a social story. So you can be like, this is the house that we're going to, to go spend time with family and you take a picture of the house. And then this is what the living room looks like. Um, but when I do that, I always try to think, what can I do to accommodate when we do do things like that? And then of course I have like a very big car that I have lots of things in and where my son can hide and listen to music and everything. If, if anything gets too, too much. Um, every time we do these trainings, People always ask us like, well, what happens when this, when this student does this or when my nephew does this or my brother does this, can, how can I help them? Um, and what I always say is that it's very hard for us to give you specific how-tos, um, uh, how to do certain things without us knowing your brother or your student or your child um, or your client or your patient. Um, so I, when I show, when we show you this thing of accommodations, I really want you to kind of also put in your pocket that you're going to be an investigator anytime you get in contact with someone that has autism. So, oh, they do seem agitated. What can I do to help them? Um, and, you know, you can offer these accommodations. So where could you provide a quiet space? Um, are fidget toys allowed? How can you make comfortable? To, how can you make it more comfortable? Can you turn off the lights, turn down the lights? Maybe it smells weird in there. Can you take them to somewhere different? Um, what permissions do you need from your supervisors, your uh, bosses, um, your family to be able to make these accommodations? And how can you yourself do to accommodate uh, a person with autism? And then let's go to advanced notice. Um, autistics often prefer routines and rituals. Um, and we talked a little bit about that at the DSM-5. Um, that's why it's important to always give advance notice before you do any changes um, in a routine that you have already established with someone who has um, autism. So if you work with someone and the routine very changes, advance notice. If you have a child that's gonna be doing something different, advance notice. If you have a student that uh, is gonna be changing teachers or changing classes, advance notice. And the bigger the advance notice, the bigger the time that you have to give. So um, an example would be like, my sons have to get ready and go to their grandparents. 
And so what I do is I put a timer and I say, hey, you have 20 minutes to do whatever you want. And then after that, we start getting ready to go see grandma and grandpa. Um, and that uh, really helps. They'll, they'll just start finishing whatever they're doing and they're getting ready for that transition. Um, but if we're going on vacation, um, I have to do social stories. I have to do um, like, this is the hotel we're staying at. I have to make sure they have their little backpacks full of everything they need, fidgets, art supplies and everything. Um, and I give them probably like a week's notice or events notice. So more time or less can be identified depending on what you know of your autistic person. And again, that's that investigative please really get to know who you're working with, really get to know what makes them comfortable, what makes them um, feel centered and grounded um, and how to help. And so the more you investigate to get to know the person, the more you're gonna be able to give advance notice and give accommodations. Yay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So Kate, you, yeah, do we have time for the video? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I'll do the island. Well, this is a video about um, what to do when meltdowns or overloads happen. So we'll let her, um, she, she describes it really beautifully. And, and so we like this video. Autistic meltdowns are not a tantrum. They are a neurological overload. It gets the body physically prepared to fight and flight by releasing lots of nasty stress hormones. Our brain activates cortisol, adrenaline, gets your heart pumping, the blood delivered to your muscles, so you can fight or run away, flee the situation. The difficulty is that autistic people will become overloaded from a lot of things because we are sensory sensitive, cognitively overloaded the adrenaline and your heart's racing so much and you're sweating so much you can barely even think i don't even know what i'm saying i feel like i need to fight the situation to survive why does this happen triggers baby triggers iceberg theory we all have a conscious and underneath that in the unconscious and the subconscious our memories and other past traumas which we all keep bearing. We may be triggered because a routine has broken and we feel anxious outside of that. So we control a lot of the things in the environment to make it predictable. Some autistic people when they melt down will shut down, completely freeze and go inwards on themselves. And I know what that feels like, you go completely numb. All the awful bad feelings come over me and I can, I actually become mute. I, I don't often speak for an hour or so when I'm in those states. Speaking about it makes me stim. <laughs> because it's a physical response, your autistic person cannot help this. It is not deliberate. It is our jobs as adults to react appropriately to autistic distress and trauma. See which one you think is more helpful. I'm having a meltdown and I'm hitting myself and I'm throwing things everywhere and I'm telling you that I hate you and you're saying, yeah, well, I hate you too and I don't think you're great either and your behaviour is disgusting and I'm never going to give you that present and I'm cancelling your birthday party. The autistic person will fight and fight and fight because they feel it is the end of the world and they have nothing to lose. So try this. I know you are sad. I know you are angry. I am sorry you are in pain. How can I help? Is there anything I can do? Would you like me to go away? Would you like me to be quiet? Do you need a minute? Do you need a glass of water? Do you need a pen and a paper to show me? Can you show me through a movie or in a book? Can you draw how you feel? What are you afraid of? Validate your autistic. Validate how terrified they are in that moment. Even though it doesn't make sense to you, they may fight it. They may say to you, well, of course I'm not okay. Speak autistic, speak in blunt, factual, re logical terms. Say, I know you're not okay. I know you are sad. If you are finding that you are becoming overloaded from the meltdown, take a step back. That's not planned ignoring, that's you going away to get a drink, to look after yourself, regulate yourself so you can be better equipped to help that person in distress. But you cannot do it if your fight flight has been activated and you're fighting them as well. If you're in a situation with your meltdowns and you're asking, why is this not getting better? Ask yourself, are you fighting the meltdown as well? And if so, we have a few people in fight flight here and all of it needs to be deactivated. 
autistic meltdowns are not. So hopefully you can see why we love that video. That's it. Um, she just does a beautiful job of, of explaining a lot of stuff. Um, and Max has said it already, and I think Kate's probably said it, and I'm going to say it again too. People always want, when we do these trainings, they want real, like, show me what this looks like. Show me what I can do. Tell me, I want more examples. I want, I want more examples of this and that. But the, the thing is, is everyone is going to be so different. And we we can talk about this for hours. We'd love to. We'd love to do more trainings. We love talking about that. This hour is so short. But at the end of the day, it's going to be very person specific. Um, and yeah, but but there are some tips that you can that can help in general. So for meltdowns, what can we do? Maybe clear the space, maybe go to a different room if someone needs a different room. Um, ensure safety. We're never advocating that people are getting hurt, um, that just because someone is autistic, they have the right to hurt or punch people or hurt themselves. Sometimes that's really difficult. Um, so we want to ensure that everyone is safe in the environment. Um, manage sensory if it is a sensory issue. If you if you can somehow, like someone suggested, headphones. If you can get headphones, if you can get sunglasses. Um, sometimes there's smells. That's my really big sensory issue. Um, so yeah, uh, get grounded yourself. This can look like being emotionally grounded or actually just sitting down on the ground when it comes to maybe smaller people like my little son, I can sit down on the ground and um, still maintain a safe environment so that he can see that I'm calm, I'm relaxed and I'm here for him and what he needs. Um, but that can also be just yourself grounded. Like she was talking in the video, do you need to go get a drink of water so that you can be regulated yourself and they can feel that regulation and you can help there. Um, again, manage your own emotions with that. Um, what are you, depending on the meltdown, big or small, what are you bringing to it that might be making it worse? Or can you manage your own emotions first and help that get better? Um, remember that they're not trying to manipulate you. So just because someone is is crying doesn't mean, not just crying, but in a meltdown that they're just trying to get what they want. Um, sometimes it can just be that they cannot fathom or understand the situation that they are in. And that might seem like they're trying to get what they want, but not being able to perceive the situation that you are in, whether that is a sensory thing, whether that is that McDonald's ran out of ice cream, whatever that might be, can feel like life or death can feel like fight or flight. Um, and then also behavior is communication. So if someone is screaming, that means something is happening, right? Um, they're trying to communicate something. Um, and it is going to be hopefully as an ally, your job to try to figure out what that communication is um, if they can't do it appropriate if they can't do it in the way that you perceive um, and another thing that I just wanted to make a side note um, I would never recommend holding someone down unless there's an extreme safety issue um, we we don't sometimes you might think like oh they just need a bear hug but that can be even worse in a lot of situations so really knowing your person knowing what they want not just your person but also not um, seeing Oh, sorry. Just because we give you this information and you see someone in a meltdown, if you don't know them, don't go interact, right? There could be, their mom could be trying to help them. And if they asked for help, then okay. But don't, don't be like, I know what they need. They need this and this and this. You can try to offer water or something like that. But um, yeah, don't just presume that because you took an autism training that now you're going to know everything that they need. But on that note, we, I know we're just on time, so I'm just going to do quickly, but we just thank you guys for being here and we want you to join us in allyship and the, we're, all the work that you do, however you interact with autistic individuals, um, just to speak up, to advocate, to encourage others to, to advocate as well, to engage in things and communicate with us and let us know all your information so we can share with our people. We're always wanting to build our resource lists. So thank you guys so much. We'll stick around if there's other questions or whatever, if, those, if Selena's okay with that. And, but thank you guys so very much for everything. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kate, Jade, and Maxine.
Ooh, there's a great question in the chat. Is there a group support group for native parents? Oh, I would love to create one. <laughs> so um, I was I was born and raised here. Uh, my grandmother was full blooded Pascoyaki, and then my great grandmother was also full blooded Pascoyaki. I, I was raised on the reservation. Um, and I facilitate the parent peer support group. So for me, that is a native group just because I am native, um, but I'm also black and I'm also Mexican. Um, and uh, we have it virtually the first, uh, the second Wednesday of every month. And then we have it in person um, the fourth Thursday of every month. Um, and I would love for everyone to be able to come and uh um, you'll find that uh, the experience of being a parent or a caregiver with someone that has autism is very um, similar in, in all uh, demographics of people. Uh, it's it's a hard journey and um, and to know that you're not alone and you can do this. Um, and there's like thousands of us where we are legion. I always say that we are legion um, that we just, you know, please, I, I'm inviting you to come to my peer parent support group and see um, how you like it. And if not, then, you know, I can also make another one um, as well, so. We had a monthly meeting down here before COVID, but I lost touch. Um, Monica Romero had asked if they had a monthly meeting down here. Did Max answer your question or was it a different She one? said none for 